Hello and welcome to the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. My name is Mitty Chang. I'm president for this Rotary Club for just about another couple of weeks. Uh, and I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. It's my honor to introduce all of you, some of our members on the call, and we're going to have uh, one of our immediate past presidents and charter president introduce our guest speaker. Um, speaking of which, to my left, as I see it, uh, Russian wave hi to everyone. That is Russian. Russian is our immediate past president and charter president of our Rotary Club, and he is also a uh, founder and executive director of his nonprofit called Next Vista. And he's an educator, a speaker, and many other things. Uh, and we'll leave that uh, there. And right before Russian, Sviako, if you'd like to wave hi to everyone. Sviako is a project manager, usually based in South Africa, although he does move about quite a bit. So he may not be there right now, but um, he's been a member of our club and also a board member. And he also runs our Coffee with the Rotarian initiatives. Um, next to Sviako, we have Steven. Steven, go ahead and wave hi to everyone. Stephen is our president-elect. He will be taking over my position in just a couple of weeks, and he is very excited for to do that, as am I. Uh, Stephen is normally a financial advisor for Mass Mutual here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And to the right of Stephen, as I see it, is Nathan. Nathan, wave hi to everyone. All right. Nate is an educator in, based in, to um, well, he used to be based in the Tokyo, Japan area. He has moved a little bit, from my understanding, but he is still in the Japan area, and um, he is educator and also our uh, one of, gives makes our one of our favorite 360 videos actually. So if you ever check out some of his coffee with the Rotarian videos, you'll notice that it comes with this awesome 360 degree video. So you'll definitely have to check that out. Um, some pretty awesome stuff there from Nate. And below we have Shag. Shags, way if I do one. There you go. Um, Shags is on our board and also one of our charter members. He is a money coach uh, based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And he also is a master home cook and chef. Makes amazing paella. Awesome. Welcome to uh, the program, everyone. I'm going to turn it back to Rushton to introduce our guest speaker for the week. Rushton, please. Thank you, Mitty. Uh, everybody, we have a wonderful program set up for us today. Uh, the, the idea of getting, getting someone to tell us about science that is not science that happened you know, merely a few years ago, but, but stuff that's happening right now is something that I think is going to be exciting for everybody. Uh, we have with us Dr. Phil Valick. And Dr. Valick uh, is a graduate of Illinois State University, did his PhD work at Auburn, and then in 2001 ended up in San Antonio at the Southwest Research Institute, which uh, partners with NASA on on, I believe several projects, but for Dr. Valley, the focus is on the Juno project. And so, you know, we're going to learn lots of things today about, uh, about what Juno is, what it is doing, and how much we are learning that is new about how we imagine our solar system and that rather fascinating planet as, as a function of, of that. So, Dr. Valley, uh, thank you so much for taking your time. Uh, I hope that, uh, that this will be an opportunity for everybody to get excited about the kinds of science that is happening uh, right now. Well, thank you. This is a lot of fun. Thanks for the uh, invitation, and uh, can't wait to start telling you more about us. So, uh, let's see, make sure I'm sharing that. Hopefully, everyone can see what's up on my screen right now. Move this over. So, I'm going to be talking today about Juno at Jupiter. But um, even though I'm, let's see, I kinda, oops. There we go. Even though I'm the one giving this talk, it's really on behalf of the whole Juno team. Uh, it takes a, an army of scientists, engineers, programmers, planners, of, operators of all different types to get this done. And so it's really a testament of the large community that works on this. So if you look at it, you know, any, your knowledge of Jupiter, you looked at any classic pictures of the planet, you've probably have seen something like this. And it's a beautiful planet. Um, these striking bands that go from east to west, uh, the, uh, the, the, the storms, the swirls you see on it. And then if you put it in motion, you look at any time-lapse uh, movies of it, you see just how dynamic it is. These storms are spinning, the bands are moving past each other. Uh, it's a huge, amazing, beautiful system. But even from this picture we have right here, we only can see so much. There's so much that we want to know about the planet. What's going on underneath the clouds? What happens some distance away in its magnetosphere? Talking about, and even such a simple question as, what does it look like in the top and the bottom? 
uh, before the Juno mission, we have never been had a perspective where we could see what happens at the North or South Poles. But uh, the Juno mission is a mission of first, and one of the things that we will see is, uh, uh, is when we can see now is what happens at the North and South Pole. Um, this is the South Pole of Jupiter. All those little dots and all those uh, spots you see in there, and I say little, those are, many of them are Earth size. Uh, everything at Jupiter is just huge. Um, size of Earth, size of Texas, you know, big, <laughs> different uh, here. It, the complexity and the beauty extends all the way to the, to, to the poles. And so that's what we're doing with uh, Jupiter, to, uh, with Juno, to learn about it. So Jupiter itself, we've known about it for a long time. The ancients knew about it. It's one of the brightest uh, things you will see in the night sky. Uh, only the moon and Venus are brighter. So you can go out on a clear night and hopefully see it. And if you have a, a nice powerful telescope, you can learn a lot about it. Um, it's the biggest of the planets in our solar system. When the solar system formed, first thing that formed was the sun. Most of everything became the sun. Of what was little left became Jupiter. And then what's very little left after that became everything else. So understanding Jupiter is uh, key to understanding how our whole system works. Um, the planet itself is not just large, but it's magnetosphere. I mean, said this a few times. The magnetosphere is this bubble of the magnetic fields uh, around it. So there's this picture here that if we could see this invisible structure, if we could see these magnetic fields, we could see these currents from Earth uh, from half a billion miles away, it would be larger than the moon. So it's a, it's a large system. Um, one of the things that I had to learn when I first started doing Jovian science is there's only so many ways to say the word big and you quickly run out of it. So it's uh, a massive system. Um, we have been studying Jupiter for a long time, for centuries in fact, going back to Galileo when he first pointed his telescope at Jupiter and saw the moons going around. Um, that was obviously a shift in how we think about our, our solar system as our place in the universe. Uh, going into the 70s, we've had the Pioneer and Voyager spacecraft and their flybys. Uh, and, and even to this day, even though that's you know, 30, 40 years old data, it's still some of the best data we have. They were the Voyager missions were, and the Pioneer missions, and a lot of the NASA missions, uh, most of the NASA missions have always been incredible and keep going. Um, there's a mission called Ulysses that had also done a flyby in the 90s, and uh, Ulysses is the first spacecraft to get out of the ecliptic plane of the solar system, and it had to use the, the massive gravity well of Jupiter to get that kick up and over, and so going through there, it had an, another opportunity to study the system. And then, the Cassini mission, which is currently in orbit around Saturn for not that much longer. Its mission's coming to an end this year. It's going to be diving into, its, uh, into the atmosphere uh, to have its end of mission. And the New Horizons mission that flew by uh, a while back, but just a couple of years ago, did a flyby of Pluto. And hopefully you remember some of those beautiful images that came out. Both of those used the, uh, the ma massive gravity of Jupiter to get a little kick to get where they were going. And those, all these have been helping add the picture, but all these missions have been flybys, going once by it. Um, in the 2000s, there was the Galileo mission, which went into orbit, uh, studying the magnetosphere and, it, and the planet, and it also had a probe that had dropped into the atmosphere to study what was going on there. And then in early this year, uh, excuse me, about five years ago, we launched and just got into orbit uh, less than a year ago was the Juno mission, July 4th, 2016. So we're coming on our one year anniversary with that. And Juno is the first one to go up and over the poles. I said it's a unique orbit. And then uh, we are in the process of planning the next missions and building the next mission. So both NASA and the European Space Agency are gonna be sending missions coming up in the 2030 timeframe to study the moons These uh, of Jupiter. And it's not just the planet that's amazing, but it goes all the way out. So Juno is studying uh, many things. One of the things we're trying to understand, I mentioned before, to understand the, our place in the solar system, we need to understand how the planet worked. And to doing that, we're understanding what it's made of. Uh, what is the composition? How much water is in this planet? We're also studying the interior, what's going on inside underneath these clouds, something we can't do, we couldn't do before. Uh, the atmosphere, we're studying what is it made of, how these clouds go. And then the magnetosphere, this magnetic bubble around the planet, uh, and, and 
not just this bubble, but the visible uh, in, uh, output of it is the auroras. Just like we have auroras at Earth in our poles, Jupiter has auroras. But as I'll show you in a little bit, um, just like everything else, it's just huge and massive. Juno is our tool to do it. It is a large spacecraft, about 20 meters in diameter at 66 feet in diameter. Uh, when you look at it, one of the first things that probably jumps out at you are these large, these three solar panels that come off. Uh, Juno is the only spacecraft that's ever had solar panels in orbit around Jupiter. It's the first one um, to, to do uh, use solar power in, in any of the outer planets. It's very difficult to do. We get 1 25th of the solar power at Jupiter than you do at Earth. So that's one of the reasons we need such a large spacecraft. Um, the mission has a large set of instruments. Uh, also, as just to point out to you, if you look, there's a silhouette of a person standing next to the spacecraft, you get a feel of just how big it is. Uh, we have a large set of instruments on it. We have to study the interior, um, a gravity instrument and a magnetometer to study these fields coming from the planet. Um, the spacecraft itself is the gravity measurement. As it comes in its orbit, any changes in density inside the planet will have slightly different gravity fields and that will push and pull on the spacecraft a little bit as it goes by. And measuring its trajectory with high accuracy, we can now unwrap what the gravity field had to be. There's a radiometer, which is gonna use the probe, the atmosphere, and measure what's the composition, what's going on at depth below the cloud tops. There are our particles and field uh, instruments, are JEDI, Jade, and Waves. These uh, measure the particles and the electromagnetic waves going through there, and the magnetometer, all those go together to help us measure the larger uh, magnetosphere. What are the particles? What are the currents flowing? Where are they going to? What's, how does the energy and mass flow through this large system? Now we have a number of cameras. There's the UVS and GERM camera cameras. UVS measures ultraviolet light, and GERM measures infrared light. And then these, again, allows us to see kind of a global picture, but also what the composition of these particles coming in. And then finally, there is Juno cam. This is a... Uh, an optical camera that's taking images of the system, and this is being done largely by citizen scientists. And so uh, we are, that basically lets us have this enormous team that's working on this great data set. So we do have a large team. Um, we have team members that come from around the world, not just here in San Antonio and at JPL at Pasadena, but uh, across our country and across uh, uh, the other countries. Um, this slide here shows, it's, it's a little embarrassing because there's, we know there's so many more team members out there who are working on it. It's a very large team. And then, as I mentioned before, JunoCam. So JunoCam is this data set that we're taking. It's being, in many ways, planned by the community and the data is being processed by the community. So these are people from around the globe. Anyone who has an internet connection can be working on this data set. So one of the things we're learning about is the interior of Jupiter. And so uh, the slide I'm showing right now shows some of the models that were proposed before we got there. But the big question is, what's going on inside? How big, does it have a core? Does, how big is it? Um, is it structures? Do you see things that happen? Why are these bands we see in the clouds? Is it being driven from internally? We, we know it has these massive magnetic fields. How are those put together? Um, one of the things, to, to do these full mappings, we need a lot of the mission because every orbit we go through, we get a, a slice of the picture. And as we go through, we look at different longitudes. And as the mission pro progresses, we'll fill in the picture further and further. But one of the things that we have learned to, to date is that the models, the picture we had of Jupiter before we got there is incomplete. And so um, the models are just not right. And so this is one, as an experimentalist, this is great for me. Um, we love to go through and see that the best theories we came up to are, are missing something, and that means we're going to be learning a lot of new stuff. Um, the atmosphere. And so you've seen, hopefully, if you've gone online and seen any of these pictures of, uh, uh, from Juno, and if you haven't, please, I, I encourage you to go through, um, we're seeing these amazing pictures. These are just the cloud tops of Jupiter. Um, we are learning so much about we're seeing all these storms and these swirls, and we're doing it from a, a vantage point that no one's ever been before. As we're going across the equator, the spacecraft is only about 3,000 kilometers away. 
on a planet that has a, a radius of 70,000 kilometers. So we are as right up to it as just about. And so the pictures we're taking are from this incredible perspective and we're seeing things, these swirls, these colors that uh, we haven't seen before. Um, it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's when we show these images in our science meetings and every time they bring up one of these new images, we all just kind of stop and stare for a while. And it's just, it just kind of puts you in place of where we are in our understanding. And then what I do personally is work on the Magnetosphere's team. And this is that, that's for that large magnetic bubble that's being driven by this large magnetic field of Jupiter. It's, it's uh, this huge magnetic field creates a structure that extends hundreds of times larger than Earth's magnetosphere. Uh, Earth's magnetosphere is something we know fairly well because we have decades of putting instruments and, and missions around orbiting it. Um, and, but it's very different than Jupiter. So at Earth, we're being driven primarily by the sun. It's kind of an, an externally driven system where Jupiter is just the opposite. It's primarily an internally driven system. And so you have this enormous source of particles. The moon Io, it's the most volcanic uh, place in the solar system, is putting out a ton of sulfur dioxide every second. A large, about half of that's getting ionized, becomes a plasma, and helps inflate this bubble around us and uh, helps makes this complicated system and helps drive it. And, and on top of that, Jupiter, the planet itself, is rotating at a very high rate. It, takes, it has a 10 hour day. And so these large magnetic fields are zipping around every 10 hours at hundreds of kilometers per second, and it's building up this large system. So if you look at this, uh, this, this illustration next to it, we have something called a current sheet that's being drawn on there. So all these heavy particles, it's like being spun around on a, on a ride at an amusement park, you get thrown out, and so it has this very strong disk of plasma. And so we've known about that. We've had missions that's going through there, and we've had many opportunities to study it, but we have never been able to, to as mentioned before, go over the poles and study what's, the, what's really happening there. And so this is the first time doing it. And this is a picture, actually, uh, is put together by one of the, uh, the team scientists, and there's two parts of it. So this big bean-shaped structure that's in kind of the lower center of the image, that is the northern aurora of Jupiter. And so this bean oval-like structure, that's called the main aurora, that's the main oval. Uh, just outward of it, you see kind of a bright spot and a tail tracing away. That is one of the moons. And so in this dynamic system, you have, I think about this uh, galactic uh, uh, arc welder. And so these are magnetic footprints that are, attaching from that moon back to the upper atmosphere of the planet and particles are racing back and forth and that's what that bright spot there and then in the very center you see this kind of reddish color that's something we call the polar aurora these are uh, when you watch any movie of it it's very dynamic a lot of things are changing and this is uh, what's going on where you're seeing uv light that's coming from deep in the atmosphere coming out you don't really understand what's going on there very well um, for comparison, in the upper right, you see this, this, this small little structure. Well, that's, that's the Earth and the Earth's aurora, taken by pictures taken from another camera we built for Southwest Research years ago, um, orbiting Earth. And you can just see just how large the Jupiter aurora is when you compare it to Earth. So uh, Jupiter has its a strong magnetic field. It's offset about 10 degrees from the rotation axis of Jupiter. And so as it spins around, you have this kind of disc that's off at an angle and kind of wobbles back and forth. Um, this, uh, that movie to the, to the right, you see this kind of wobbling back and forth. That's images taken from Earth of the radiation coming from the, uh, the planet. And you can see it kind of wobbles back and forth. It kind of wiggles up and down. And for magnetospheric science, you don't want to be Often you want to be in that, that wiggling frame there, this, this, the, mag, the magnetic fields frame. And so we do these things we call wiggle plots. And so that's what's shown right here. If you look at the, this wiggle going around, going out and back in, uh, that is the trajectory of the spacecraft in a magnetic frame. So if you think about this, this disk that's wobbling back and forth, um, you ride along with it, the nice smooth trajectory of a spacecraft will look like from that frame going up and down. And so we're showing here a picture of where we're seeing particles going out. And the numbers, this goes out to 100 Jovian radii. Um, that's something like 7 million kilometers. 
Um, and so there's a lot of structures on here. When you see bright red colors in there, that you're seeing a lot of particles. When you see dark blues, not very many. And if you look at it, uh, going at this value of Z near zero, looking out, you see near the planet, you see a lot of bright red spots. That's that plasma disk I was talking about. That's at the equator. And then periodically as you move out, you'll see bright streaks coming out. And every now and then, our space will get so far out, we'll cross through, it's called the magneto sheet. The solar wind is moving at supersonic speed, so it's just like a supersonic jet flying through the atmosphere. You have many of that same physics going on, and you get this bubble wrapping around the planet. And depending on how hard the solar wind is blowing, sometimes that bubble gets pushed in or expands out, and we have opportunities to go back in and out of it. And so we're seeing this huge picture of plasma going not only from near the planet, but going all the way out to the edges. So what's next for the mission? We are in these large 53-day orbits where we go all the way into a few thousand kilometers to the planet to, to uh, all the way out to the edge of the magnetosphere. Um, and we're gonna keep doing those orbits and studying the whole system as a system. Our next perijove, perijove is the closest close approach to the planet, will be occurring on July 11th. And on this one, we're very excited about it. We're gonna be flying right over the great red spot. This is that storm that's been raging on Jupiter as long as we've been looking at it, so thousands of, uh, hundreds of years. Um, as we keep doing these orbits, we'll get a much larger map of the interior and the magnetic fields going on there. And then we're also getting a much larger picture of what's going on in the atmosphere and the magnetosphere. So uh, we're gonna be putting these pictures together. We have only, we're not even a year into the mission and we're already making great discoveries and figuring out what's going on and, and realizing that the the models we had of, in our minds of what should be happening need to be improved and built upon. So if you're interested more about Juno, there's a number of places you can go to get more information. There's the Juno mission website at missionjuno.swri.edu. This has a lot of information about the mission, about our orbits, about the instruments we're using, about the team. It also has links to a Juno camp. So if you want to be more involved, directly involved in the mission, I encourage you to go there. You can go vote on where we look, where we point the camera next, and the passage, and the data's there. If you wanna start pulling off the data and start working at it and doing your own image processing, uh, please do. We could use all the help we can get. Uh, NASA has always done amazing websites, nasa.gov slash Juno. You can learn a lot about the mission there. And then one thing I think particularly fun is a website that was put together uh, out of JPL called Eyes on the Solar System at eyes.nasa.gov, and this allows you to, the simulation of the solar system, it uses a lot of data and pictures of these of planets and moons, and allows you to fly through the solar system and see where all the planets and bodies are going, and there's a, num a number of modules that allow you to go and look at uh, different missions. So there's one on the Juno mission, you can follow along when we did our orbital insertion and see what our orbits look like and how the mission's gonna end. So I hope you found that interesting, and uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, any help you, as I said, you know, Juno Cam, please continue. That's awesome. Phil, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to our club. That was a terrific insight about um, how the Juno mission works out. Um, wonderful. And so uh, when you get a chance to exit the screen, then that way we can go ahead and yeah. see your awesome face while we get some of these answers. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Russian for the, the first question, and then we're going to go around with um, the group and get some questions and answers going here. Okay. Well, well, there's a certain amount of where do I start, right? Because there's so many cool pieces to that. Um, for me, kind of one of the first pieces is has to do with the citizen scientist mm -hmm. uh, kind of component of this. And so, you know, the, the video that was, that was on for our, our viewers before they watched this recording is that rather amazing three minute you know, fly by. Uh, and, and I'm guessing that you're having a lot of schools contact you as well, uh, where, where they, they're trying different things out, you know, trying to help kids get inspired, uh, you know, by, by science and astronomy in new ways. Do you, do you have a story or two kind of from that, that, that you can share? So it's, it's, we've really just started the mission. It's, uh, we've only I said we had our jo uh, Jovian orbital insertion was from July 4th, 2016. Our first science operations were 53 days later, so we're uh, just getting in with it. Um, and considering that the volume of work that's been out there that people have been working on has just been phenomenal. 
uh, we have had, um, uh, if you go online, if you just go uh, to our, any of the websites I showed you or go to uh, YouTube and look at videos that people have been posting, um, it, it's just phenomenal what's going in there. Uh, in terms of schools that have addressed it, I don't recall any that have uh, directly come and said, hey, we're looking at the data, but we're hoping that to come through. Only recently we've published our first results. There was the science paper that came out about a, um, just a few weeks ago, and then uh, there, the journal Science has two papers published in there, and then we have 44 more papers published in our uh, a journal called the Geophysical Research Letters. And so it's kind of really the floodgates have just opened. And so even though people have been working on it already and doing a huge amount of work, I just can't wait to see what happens next. Very cool. Thank you. And, and, and I'm, I'm imagining that, that for a lot of kids, I don't know, you know, you know, for me growing up, there was this sense of that, you know, Jupiter is this huge thing and it's, it's mostly just a big storm going on. I mean, just, just lots and lots of this. And that whole sense of, is, you know, is there a ground in any sense that we understand ground, right? And so, you know, I was looking at the, at the graphic in your slide, you know, talk about this huge area that is metallic hydrogen, which itself was kind of a, you know, kind of kind of thought for me. But but that that represents atmosphere and and not solid, right? Yeah, and so part of the questions are coming in right now is what's going on underneath there? Um, we got to Jupiter, so people, we're not the first mission to Jupiter. People have been working on this problem and trying to understand what's going on there for decades, and. Uh, it's an enormous amount of great work's been done. You know, this, the old saying is we only can see farther because we stand on the shoulders of giants. And that's couldn't be more true for Jupiter than, than uh, any other field. Um, but now we're getting there. Now we're getting these first measurements. And what we're seeing is things, these, these great bottles may not be consistent with reality. Um, so that picture, I, I was, I kind of was hesitating showing that picture there because that's what we thought before we got there. Now we're seeing reality and things are not as simple, quote unquote simple, as, as you know, 40 years of hard work got us to. Um, we got to Jupiter thinking, you know, we have a lot of data at Earth and we think things should be like they're at Earth. And that's, our, that's, that's what we're familiar with. And now we're getting there and we're seeing these models are more complicated than that. What's going on in the clouds? Uh, that's something we're still figuring out. So this is a time of discovery. Nice. I'm pretty sure, um, Russian, you said, great, thank you, but you were muted. So I'm just gonna, <laughs> just gonna mouth out for you. <laughs> All right, um, Phil, uh, so really interesting stuff. Um, so some of the readings from the, the Juno mission. Um, and so what I'm wondering is where do you see um, I guess, where do you see the future of um, learning with uh, and learning about Jupiter, specifically when it comes to um, 360 degree angles in terms of virtual reality? Um, and I, I, especially when it comes to uh, learning about planets and learning about uh, space, I always been really fascinated with kind of that <laughs> almost a sci fi Star Trek kind of appeal, right? Where you can kind of uh, maybe put on these uh, virtual reality goggles and be able to feel as if you're drifting through space or if you're drifting into Jupiter. Um, I, from my understanding, um, you know, some of that is starting to be pioneered a little bit in virtual reality when it comes to education in, in space. Um, but I was wondering, do you know if um, any of the data from the Juno mission is being used for that purpose? Um, or if not, is that something where, you know, either your team or a team that you know of has plans to kind of um, start doing just so that uh, when you share it with either students or even just um, uh, just people in general, they'd be a lot more interested in what they see. So I am not sure just yet if uh, someone's taking the Juno data and doing virtual reality or, or uh, flybys. That. I know NASA has done a lot of that on previous missions, and I would be frankly a little surprised if they don't do it on this one. Um, uh, Every year, there's uh, the big meeting for people to do space physics is in San Francisco. Uh, except this year, this coming year, they're doing work on Moscone, so we have to move to uh, another city, unfortunately. But we'll be back. Um, but uh, they always have a big booth there. NASA has always a big booth showing the stuff they're doing. NASA has always done a 
wonderful job of outreach and education. Um, very proud of that. Uh, and they've done uh, this, I, I mentioned before, this Eyes on the Solar System. I encourage you to go look at it. It's going to be a great time. But I also say make sure your afternoon is free before you do it because it will suck you in. And before you know it, hours will just go by. Um, you can. It is a full immersive environment. You can. You could go in a free form, free floating camera mode, and fly through the solar system and go from planet to planet, the moon to moon, see what's going on. Or it has these modules that are educational setup where you could pick a mission and it will follow you through. For the Juno mission, it starts at launch and it takes you along the orbit as you go out past the orbit of Mars and you come back in and you get the Earth fly by and you go out to Jupiter and you do the the orbital insertion and you do the orbits around there and. And you can zoom it up and have these things happen in just you know seconds. Um, so there are a lot of things out there, but that's data that's been uh, it's using a lot of the, the, the Voyager data and a lot of the Hubble images that have been taken to date. Um, the, the images we're producing right now, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be put in there. And one of the things that's been so exciting about having uh, people who are working with the data is what's coming out right now. This video showed before of this flyby from pole to pole. Um, it's, this was sent out amongst the team when it first came out. The mission principal investigator, Scott Bolton, who's also here, the guy in, in charge of the whole mission, sent it out to everyone. And I think uh, everyone kind of had to stop for an afternoon to watch this video. And just it's, even though you helped make, collect that data, when you see it in these different ways for the first time, it really just opens your eyes. Awesome. Really cool. So we have time for a couple more questions. Um, if anyone else has a question, go ahead and just unmute yourself really quick. There you go, Nate. You have to unmute yourself though. All right, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, I, I think it kind of sort of answered my question, but um, I, I just got back from this Google Earth uh, for Education Network kind of thing in Australia, and we were talking about um, you know, creating data sets and that kind of thing. You know, Google works with Google Earth. Um, but something I haven't seen, and, you know, we kind of talked about, you know, things like mapping underwater cables and all that kind of stuff, but we didn't really talk about mapping space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the Juno team or maybe NASA, um, has there been any kind of partnering with companies like Google that can bring that data in so that kids can manipulate that stuff? And you talked about, you know, like these things that students can do online. But I'm kind of, you know, curious about partnering with other, you know, companies because Google has a very strong education suite, you know, something where there's that, you know, Google space. Is that, you know, coming out or anything? Well, I, okay. So this, this eyes on the solar system we were just talking about, it feels very much like Google Earth, but for the whole solar system. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know JPL led the development of it. I don't know what partner they did with it, um, but uh, we are always looking for for help. It's amazing how much data we're producing, um, how much data comes down on these missions. Yeah, I imagine, um, yeah. And so, any, it, you know, these, I keep going back to Juno okay. Cam, it, it just wouldn't have been possible unless we got the, the larger community of all these citizen scientists involved, um, the work that's coming out of it. And uh, I don't, don't know specifically about Google, but um, there are people who are working on that. I'm not on the, the education outreach approach uh, side of it but there are people who are working on that and <clears throat> that anyone who helps on it it's, it's much appreciated very cool okay one more quick question too sorry um uh you know because i'm a teacher uh, my current well the school that i just left we've actually had kids go to nasa for these you know young innovator competitions kind of thing um what advice would you suggest i give students if i see a kid that they're really into science but the, you know they're, they're a little more into space and that kind of thing what would what would i see that would really inspire them I guess. So if, or if what they, path should they take, I guess. Yeah. So maybe a little bit about my path. A lot of people who do space science, like I do, um, many of us have, or most of us have our PhDs. So that's, that's, um, essential. Yeah. So they should be thinking about education, about schools they want to go to. If when they get to an undergrad, learn your basics, you know, um, you're going to have to learn your, your electricity and magnetism, your classical mechanics, your statistical mechanics, all those things. And, and get involved. Start, there are, even at the high school level, but definitely when you get into college, there's a lot of opportunities for internship programs, 
There's a program mm -hmm. called REU, which is re, uh, Research Experiences for Undergraduates. Mm -hmm. um, most universities, business departments are doing research. Get involved and work on that. Even if it's not directly space, you're gonna start doing research. And then as you move forward, that's just all gonna help build on itself. And then start looking at programs. At, at, um, there are a number of schools that are focused on space research. And if that's really what you wanna do, uh, start getting in contact with people early on. Um, so, uh, that's, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot to be, there's a lot to be done, you know, again, I'll go back to NASA. NASA has a strong educational component. There's a lot of opportunities. Hopefully we had an opportunity to see some of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we always want to have more bright scientists out there. It's amazing how often we'll have a group of kids come through for a tour and there'll be some shy kid who will raise his hand or we'll have an, an undergrad working with us or someone who, who kind of bashfully say, I got a, kind of a dumb question, but, and they'll ask their question. And all of us experts will hear this question and we'll stop and we'll say, huh, that's a great question. And we'll just start scratching our heads. So get involved. Cool. cool. Many places. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, Phil, I just got uh, one last question for you. And you mentioned this a, a few times during your, your talk, uh, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about it. Um, I think I know what you mean, but I just wanted to make sure I know what you mean. So you said uh, throughout the talk, um, citizen uh, scientists uh, as, a, as a phrase. Um, now, are you referring to everyone who's not working at NASA or for the government, or, or what are you talking about specifically? Yeah, you know, sometimes we call them amateur scientists, but we look at the quality of the work that's coming out of it, and we know that's just not appropriate. Um, these are largely people who are not directly on the Juno project um, or not on a NASA project. So um, the way the JunoCam data is working, and if you go to that, the uh, Mission Juno website, um, every orbit, every paradrome that comes up, there's a planning sequence of where are we going to be pointing the cameras. And as we get close to it, we have a, a voting. And so first step is it's open to anyone. Um, go, goes online to the website and they click on, you know, points to the planet and says, hey, we should look here, we should look there. And it's largely, there'll be a subset based on how the orbit's coming through where we could even look. But based on that, then people start voting and saying, yeah, this point over here, this storm we saw last time, we should really focus on that. Or there's a, a feature that was dubbed the string of pearls. It's, this chain of storms we've seen uh, people vote on that and then once the voting comes in that will dictate where the camera is being pointed as it passes over we do this pair of pass that occurs in just we go from pole to pole in just a couple hours um, our top speed is about 150,000 miles an hour to get to the perspective there it's the fastest man-made object um, yeah, going right now and then once that data is out there uh, it's again it's open to anyone come and look at it now, some of these citizen scientists are people who have been doing data processing for years. Uh, maybe they're retired NASA scientists. There's one who's been doing a lot of work. Um, he is a person who has done amazing work. He loves doing this stuff, and he doesn't want it to be his job because it's his hobby. And so that's, but if he wanted to get a job, he can get it at a drop of the hat, I'm sure. Um, but these are people who have just have an interest. They're not, directly associated with the project, but again, the project is, the only reason we're being so successful is because of their input. So we couldn't be more thankful for them. Nice, well, thank you for explaining that. That makes a lot more sense. All right, Phil, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you viewers for watching our program this week, um, members and guests. As a quick reminder, we have uh, related links right below this video. Um, some of those links that Phil did mention in his slide. And we also have the opportunity for you to leave a comment at the bottom of this meeting. So please do so. Share your thoughts about what you thought about the program, the meeting. And if you have any questions for Phil, go ahead and ask him in the question comments area. And we'll go ahead and reach out to Phil and see if he can get you an answer. Um, and of course, members and visiting Rotarians, if you're looking for a meeting credit, make sure you submit the 10 survey. Uh, we will have that sent out to you as a receipt if you're visiting Rotarian via email. Otherwise, um, we thank you for visiting our program this week. We look forward to seeing you next week. And we're going to turn it over to Phil for some closing words. Phil, go ahead. 
Okay, well, thanks. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, uh, I hope you guys find it at least half as interesting as we do. Um, the more we look at this amazing planet, the more we're learning, and the more we're, we're learning that we don't know much, and there's just so much more to learn. Um, going forward, if you're interested, just look at any of these links, go be a part of the JunoCam team. Um, there's just so much to be done there from just making images to helping voting on it to being a real part of figuring out what's going on, discussing what's going on in these images. Um, we have just really begun. We're only about a year in and we have uh, a number of orbits going through. We're only on our seventh orbit coming up and, uh, and we're gonna be crossing over the great red spot coming up there. So we're all, you know, that's uh, interested in that, seeing what we're gonna see there. So thanks again for that um, and go Juno. All right, go Juno. See you guys next week. <laughs>